Well, good morning, Bayleaf. Good morning. Good to see you. My name is Lyle LaFountain. I'm one of the pastors here at Bayleaf. It's good to see everybody. If you're a guest with us, we'd like to welcome you this morning. Glad you're here. I'd like to say to everybody online, hello. I know most of you that uh, will visit us one day are going to check us out online first, so we hope to meet you one day. And it's good to have everybody with us. Man, we really needed that rain this weekend, man. Like, uh, I don't know if we have any allergy people out there, right? But that yellow wrath kind of came upon us this week, right? I mean, like, I was kind of, I was worried because, like, I got to preach this weekend. I was like, man, I hope I don't, like, break out or whatever and, you know, get all choked up and stuff like that. Uh, I'm... On, fr- on uh, Friday night, I had one of my, my pastor friends from Charlotte, he came over for dinner, and he said he was driving down the road, and he's like looking out, he's like, man, it looked like, he thought it was like clouds of fire were out there, and it, he realized it was like clouds of pollen. I mean, it's crazy how that happens. Like, the f- beginning of the week, you just see that yellow dust. You know, I remember, you know, I was going to bed uh, at night, and then I woke up the next morning, I looked out in the driveway, and I was like, who parked the yellow school bus in the driveway? Like, what is going on, Right. Um, you know, me and my family, me and my wife, we've had three kids in the last three and a half years. So if we keep at that pace, we're going to need a yellow school bus, right? So, uh, you know, but it's, it's crazy what wind will do, right? Wind just blows. Um, I had a, like an experience of this in college. In college, I had an opportunity to play uh, baseball. And my sophomore year of college, I really struggled hitting the outside pitch. Uh, that's where, like, the pitchers would, it was my weakness, they would go for that. They throw me those outside curveballs, and I, I just would, I'd pull off, and I'd miss, or I'd ground out. So I really worked on that my sophomore year. Um, so my junior year, I had this opportunity where uh, I'd really worked on it, and uh, I, I was playing out in the Midwest. We had a game at, at Creighton. In downtown Omaha, in the Midwest, they have pretty strong winds. So I come up to bat in the bottom of the ninth, uh, three two count, two outs, two guys on, we're down by two, okay? So I come up to bat, and I know the pitcher's gonna work me away, and he throws me a curveball away, right? And so I go with it, I hit it, I hit it to the opposite field, I hit it down the right field line. Now, on this day, there was a, a wind blowing down towards right field, and man, the, the wind just took this ball, and it took it over the fence for a game-winning home run around the right field foul pole, right? And uh, these were my glory days, right? So, uh, uh, but man, in my own power, in my own strength, I could never hit a home run to right field. I needed the wind. The wind had to take that ball because in my, you know, I'm, I'm skinny. My own power, it would never happen. And that's what I want to talk about today is in our own strength, and our own power, you know, we're useless, that we need God's spirit. In the Bible, the, uh, Jesus talks about the wind being the spirit. And we need God's spirit. In our own power, and our own strength, we will never be able to live the Christian life. We need God's spirit. And so if you'll turn with me to your Bibles, to Zechariah 4, that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. We're going to be looking at the power of the spirit in our lives. While you're turning there, it's the, it's the second to last book in the Old Testament, right, right before Malachi. We're beginning a new sermon series called Movement, and it's going to be a study of God's Spirit moving through his people to advance his kingdom. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at some different Old Testament uh, texts, and today we're going to be looking at Zechariah chapter 4, as we see the Spirit of God move through his people to advance his kingdom. As Baptists, we tend not to want to talk about the Holy Spirit. You know, for us, the Trinity is Father, Son, Holy Bible. Instead of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? Because we think the Spirit, like we, we have that friend who's like Pentecostal, charismatic, and they, they're kind of hanging off chandeliers. And when they go to church, it just gets a little weird. And so we're like, I don't know about the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I believe the Holy Spirit is God, but I don't know. I don't talk about him. But today we need to realize that to live the Christian life, we can't do it in our own power and our own strength. We need the Spirit of God. And that's what we're going to see here in the book of Zechariah. Zechariah is a heavy book. Um, Zechariah is a prophet. He's a priest. He comes from a prominent family. He's come out of exile from Babylon. He's come to Jerusalem with Zerubbabel, who we're going to hear about today. He's the governor. And their job is to rebuild the temple. And so in the book of Zechariah, we're going to have four visions to start off with that talk about God's grace, God's mercy towards his people. And then these second four visions that are going to talk about um, now that you receive God's grace and mercy, now you've got to go serve and lead and build. And we're going to be looking at the fifth vision today here in chapter 4. All right, so if you'll look with me, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1. Here's what the Word of God says. It says, And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me 
like a man who is awakened out of his sleep. So Zechariah, he kind of wakes up with this kind of woozy feeling. But he's not awakened into the real world. He's kind of awakened into a visionary one. Verse 2, he says, And he said to me, What do you see? And I said, I see, and behold, a lampstand all of gold with a bowl on top of it and seven lamps on it with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on top of it. So he gets a picture of this, the t- this uh, lampstand in the temple because his job is to rebuild the temple. And um, in the tabernacle, if you remember, there was a lampstand. In the temple, there was the destro- destroyed temple, there was a lampstand. And now we're seeing this lampstand in imagery. Verse 3, and, these are, and there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. And I said to the angel who talked to me, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. Now I am with Zechariah here. Like when I first read this, I was like, what is going on? Like, this is crazy. You know, Jeff gave me this passage to preach. I was like, man, this is, I don't know what is going on here. Maybe if you're reading this, you're like, I don't know what is taking place here. So he gets this vision. Let me just paint a picture for you. He gets this vision of a bowl that has these pipes that go to this lampstand. And on the lampstand, there's seven lamps. And, and, and on the right and the left, there's these olive trees, and there's this golden pipe that continually fills this bowl full of oil, the olive oil, that feeds the lamps. And the oil, as we're going to see, represents the Holy Spirit, okay? So this vision, you know, often we think of vision, it's like, man, is this like a puzzle? But visions are not puzzles, they're more like picture books of spiritual truth. And so he's going to give us this, this, uh, this spiritual truth here in verse 6. He's going to say, here's what this vision Means Verse 6, then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, he's the governor who's been tasked with building the temple. And here's the word of the Lord to him. He says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So he says, look, you're not going to rebuild this temple in your own might. Might has the idea of, of of a group of people, of a collective strength of like an army of people. He's like, you're not gonna rebuild this temple because you have an army of people to help you. And then he says, not by power. Power has the idea of individual strength. And so he's like, you're not gonna rebuild this temple by the combined strength of your men, and you're not gonna build it because you have some hero who comes in and saves the day. You're only gonna rebuild this temple by my spirit. And so he says, not by might, not by power, but my spirit. It's not going to happen because you're clever or your, your ingenuity or your creativity or your physical strength. It's only going to happen by my spirit. And as, as we look to advance the kingdom of God, the resource we need is the spirit of God. And as we go through the rest of the chapter four here, I want to give you three things the spirit of God does for us. One, God's spirit conquers our toughest challenges. Two, God's spirit builds on small beginnings, and three, God's Spirit uses the least likely people. Look with me at verse seven. We see here, God's Spirit conquers our toughest challenges. Verse seven says this, who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. You shall be laid flat. And he shall bring forward the top stone, the capstone, amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Now, Zerubbabel I'm going to have to say Zerubbabel all day. That's kind of crazy. But Zerubbabel, he, he, he's sitting there, and there is a mountain of rubble there. there is a, they built the foundation of the temple, and it's been 20 years since they, they built that foundation. So he just has this rubble that's sitting there from the previous temple, and it's just it's there. And, um, and there's people that are trying to stop the work from taking place. You have other kings and other rulers who are preventing the work from taking place. You have people like having backdoor deals, bargaining and bribing people not to do the work. You have other political actors trying to sabotage what's going on. You have some of the Israelites, the prophet Haggai tells us, they're just living for their own comfort. They're more interested in building their own house than God's house. And so they're kind of living for that. There's some older Jews who when they see the foundation laid, they're kind of saddened. They're kind of depressed because they remember the previous temple and they're like, man, this one will never be like that one, the, the glory days. It'll never be like that back then. And so the, the, the people are depressed. They're broken. Zerubbabel, he can't build this thing, and he has many challenges. Now, over the last year, right, we as a church, as people, right, we've had many challenges, right? It's been a crazy year. And we have mountains in our own lives, right? We have mountains of discouragement, mountains of fear. We have mountains of depression, 
Mountains maybe of financial crisis. Mountains maybe of addiction. Maybe criticism. Maybe, maybe it's marriage difficulties for you. Maybe there's family strife. And you're like, what am I going to do? You have these obstacles of sin and the world and the devil coming at you. What are you going to do? And you only conquer these mountains by the Spirit of God. In your own strength, in your own power, you'll never do it. If I don't try to do it in my own strength and my own power, I will fail every single time. I will fall. I will quit. And the only way we'll conquer these mountains, these tough challenges we have, is by the Spirit of God. That's what he says. O great mountain, before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. And he shall bring forward the top stone. He's going to complete the work. He's going to build the temple. He's going to have the capstone go on it. And it's going to be by grace. All the people will shout, grace, grace to it. God will finish the work. I don't know if you have dead visions or unfulfilled dreams or uncompleted projects in your life. But man, it is by the spirit of God you will take those tough challenges and you will complete them. That you will finish them. You know, as a, as, a, as a young dad with three little ones, man, I, I have a vision of, of having a godly family. And, you know, with three little ones, it gets crazy, right? And the only way I can be a godly dad and walk by the fruits of the Spirit, having love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, is by the Spirit of God. I can't do that in my own power, in my own strength. I can't have that kind of love in, in, in me, I need God's spirit to use me and go through me to be the leader of my home. And so if you have challenges in your life, the only way you'll conquer those challenges is by the spirit of God. You'll never do it in your own power and in your own strength. So that's number one. God's spirit conquers our toughest challenges. Number two, God's spirit builds on small beginnings. Look at verse eight. It says this. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands also shall complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Verse 10, for whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of the Lord which range through the whole earth. Look at verse 10. He says, for whoever has despised the day of small things. God's spirit builds on small beginnings. This, this word despise, despise the day of small things, has the idea of contempt or, or to scorn those days. You know, it's like who dares to make light of small beginnings is kind of the idea here. And in the day of Zerubbabel, man, he is dealing with, he, they built the foundation. It's now been 20 years. So his day of small things is not a day. It's years and I don't know where you are in your life. Maybe you're, you're, you're the day of small things and, and you're like, man, you know, it's been not days, but it's been years. That's where Zerubbabel has been. You know, I don't know, guys, you know, I don't know if you've ever started a home project. You get building it, right? You start, you start, you start this thing and, and you don't quite finish, right? Like any guys like that, I always remember my dad would start a project and uh, he, he would not quite finish. And I always remember my mom going, David, you need to get there and finish that work, right? And uh, I don't know if you know some of you guys are in that situation, but this is what Zerubbabel is in. They've laid the foundation. They've started the work and they haven't finished it. You know, as a family, right, we have uh, three girls, three and a half or younger, right? So it's, it's crazy. For us, me and my wife, this is the day of small things. This is the day of crazy small girl things, really, right? I mean, it is, it's just a day of like emotions and feelings and just crying. I mean, it's just, it's crazy at my house, man. Like we have three in diapers. I'm changing poopy diapers. It's nuts. You go to, they, they go to this end of the house and they make a mess and they little, you know, they fight a little bit. Then we send them over here. We clean this up. And now this side of the house is a mess. I mean, it's nuts at my house. And, um, and, and so me and my wife, sometimes we're like, man, we can't wait till the day that they can do like, you know, human things. Like they can go to the bathroom on their own. They can dress themselves. They can eat, you know, make, make food for themselves. And, and, and the thing is, you know, we kind of we despise the day of small things a little bit. But if we're not careful, we miss the opportunity in the moment. And I was a reminder of that yesterday morning. I got up and I got the family some Chick-fil-A breakfast. 
And, um, you know, Chick-fil-A, man, it just, gets, it just warms the heart, right? And uh, my little daughter, my, my oldest daughter, Lila, is sitting there at the kitchen table. We're eating some Chick-fil-A, and she's, you know, she's getting happy. So she runs around the room, and she just starts hugging everybody. She's hugging her mom, her little sister, me. She comes back. She sits back down, and she says, man, I just love everybody, and I love God. And I'm just like, oh, this is cool. You know, like, it's amazing. Like, we dis- sometimes like, man, these days of small things we kind of despise. But there's these moments where you realize, man, we got we to gotta capture these moments. We won't always have these moments. And the day of small things, when we despise them, man, the day of small things is a day of often of preparation where God is shaping you, where God is forming you. And he's getting you ready for this greater work he has for you. And so the day of small things, we shouldn't despise the day of small things. Often this is, these are the most valuable days. Like as a nation, today, like we're kind of like in the day of small things. Like we see this chaos, we see confusion, we just see, you know, conflict going on. We just, people are, you know, just constantly, you know, bickering and back and forth. We have some serious issues we're dealing with. And it's like the day of small things as the church, not just this bay leaf. We've had, you know, a, a, an interesting year, right? Some struggles. But as the church, if you saw the Gallup poll that just came out before Easter, this is the first time in eight decades that less than 50% of Americans have been a member of a church or a religious body. The first time in eight decades. So as the church, we're kind of in the, the day of, of small things. But then I read this article um, by the International Mission Board talking about Brazil. And in Brazil, they, um, there's this couple that went there. Just these two, this husband and wife, their names are William and Ann Bagby. And they went, in 1882, they planted the first Portuguese-speaking Baptist church. So before this, there were no Baptist churches in Brazil, 1882. Three generations of their family followed their work. They were inspired by what they did. And now, over 100 years later, you have 2.5 million Baptists in Brazil. Incredible. The day of small things, right? Um, The Brazilian Baptists, they planted 174 churches worldwide in 2020. Man, 1882, one couple, now 2.5 million. Now 174 churches planted worldwide outside of Brazil. Man, the day of small things turns into big things. You know, as a church, we've recently um, taken on this project of church revitalization with a Calvary Baptist Church in Morrisville. Calvary Baptist Church has four members. They've been around for 40 years. They've had some struggles. They have four members. We sent one of our own, uh, Preston Bowman, who is on our custodial staff. He's a uh, seminary student, and now he's the pastor at Calvary Baptist Church. Man, the day of small things there will one day become the day of big things because small beginnings lead to great endings with God by his spirit. And you know, as we regather as bay leaf, right, we're like in the day of small things. You might, you might look around, you're like, man, there's a, like a lot of empty seats around me. We're in the day of small beginnings. But God takes small beginnings and by his spirit, he makes great endings. That's what God does. And as we go through this series of movement, we see that God's spirit is going to work through his people to advance his kingdom. So number one, God's spirit conquers our toughest challenges. Number two, God's spirit builds on small beginnings. But number three, God's spirit uses the least likely of people. Look with me in verse 11. Then I said to him, what are these two olive trees on the right and on the left of the lampstand? And a second time I answered and said to him, what are these two branches of the olive trees? which are beside the two golden pipes from which the golden oil is poured out. And he said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Verse 14, then he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. These two anointed ones, in the Hebrew, this, this literally means these are two sons of oil. These, these are the oily ones, which is kind of weird, right? These two olive trees represent, most everyone agrees, Zerubbabel, the governor, and Joshua, the priest. Now, these two guys, like, they are pretty much nobodies. Zerubbabel, he comes from a kingly line, but he's just a governor. He's actually under the authority of a foreign king. And he's supposed to rebuild this temple, but all he has is the foundation. And so he is one of the least likely guys to do it. Joshua is not Joshua from the book of Joshua. He's not from the battle of Jericho. Joshua is just this priest, and he's a priest without a temple. That's like being a pastor without a church. 
I mean, these guys are nobody. They're the least likely guys to do it. But what God does is God moves by his spirit through people to advance his kingdom. And he advances through the least likely of us. Like, you might feel like, I don't know if God can use me. I feel like I'm weak. I feel like I have sin in my life that's holding me back. I feel like I have failures in my life. But God takes the weakest of us. He takes the least likely of us. And by his spirit, he uses us to advance his kingdom. If you remember the disciples, like in Acts chapter 4, people are amazed by the boldness of Peter and John. And they, they, they looked at them and they were like, these are uneducated, common men. And, but then they remembered that they, they had been with Jesus. And if you remember in Acts chapter 2, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. These uneducated, common men God used. And within two generations, the whole Roman Empire was taken over by Christianity. That God takes small beginnings and he makes great endings. That this, this temple vision, this lampstand, if you remember in the tabernacle, there was this lampstand. The temple, there's this lampstand. This new temple, there's this lampstand. If you remember Jesus, he says, I'm the temple, right? He says, I am the light of the world. I'm that lampstand. And then he tells us, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That we now go out as the light of the world. Now we are the lampstand and God wants to use us by his spirit to advance his kingdom and to bring him glory. God's spirit conquers our toughest challenges. God's spirit builds on small beginnings and God's spirit uses the least likely of us. Now, with our time remaining, I wanna look at what in our lives blocks the spirit's work in our lives. How do we live lives empowered by this, the Holy Spirit? I wanna look at four things. Four things that block the spirit's work in our lives, okay? Number one, ego. Maybe your pride is blocking his presence. You keep trying to do everything in your own power, your own strength. You know, if I could just get the right strategy, the right technique, the right program, I can make this happen. And you keep trying to do it yourself instead of relying on the spirit of God. You're living a prayerless life. You're, you're you know, as an American, you know, as an American, right, as a, as a red-blooded American male, man, I think I could do it in my own power, my own strength. And so often, I, I can't. I need God's spirit. I need God's spirit to work through me. First Peter 5, 6 says, humble yourselves before under the mighty hand of God so that the proper time he may exalt you. As the people of God, we need to humble ourselves. We need to get rid of our ego, get rid of our pride, and realize that we need the spirit of God. So number one, ego. Number two, comfort. Maybe your life is too safe. The Bible, uh, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the comforter. But why would you need the comforter if your life is already comfortable and safe? What do you need the comforter for if you're already living in comfort? That the Holy Spirit is given for us that we live lives of risk to advance God's kingdom. Acts 1.8, Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses to the ends of the world. If you're not being a witness by your words and your deeds to the world around you and taking risk for the gospel, what do you need the power of the Holy Spirit for? Maybe the Spirit's not working in your life because you're living a life of comfort. You know, Jesus, he said, you know, people are gonna arrest you and they're gonna interrogate you. And he says, in that very hour, the Holy Spirit will give you words to say. So often we're afraid to talk to someone, talk to our coworker, or talk to someone because we don't know what to say. But if we would take that risk, the comforter would come in and help us. He'll give us the very words we need in that very hour. So the comforter. So one is, is ego. Number two is, 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 uh, is, is comfort. But number three is volume. Maybe your life is too loud. You're, you know, we're constantly living loud lives. We're taking input from other minds and other people continually, right? We got the TV on. We got the iPod. We, is the iPod even a thing anymore? I don't even know. Um, you know, we got, we got the phone. We got social media scrolling. You know, it's designed to get you addicted, to keep scrolling so they can sell your attention for ad dollars. And so you're just always on that. We're always taking in this noise. We're constantly multitasking, right? I don't know, moms, maybe you've, you're, you've, you found yourself emailing on the computer, talking on the phone and cooking dinner at the same time, right? Like me getting this sermon ready, I was, uh, I was, uh, I was changing a poopy diaper 
take, texting on my phone and coloring a book at the same time, like, and working on my sermon. Like, it's just, it's crazy, the multitasking. And we've lost the art of focusing on one person and one thing at a time. And it's detrimental to our spiritual life. Uh, the mar- missionary martyr Jim Elliott, he said this, I think the devil has made it his business to monopolize on three elements, noise, hurry, and crowds. And Satan is quite aware of the power of silence, that we need silence in our lives, that we need to get rid of the volume and the noise so that we can spend time with God, that we need to turn off the computer, turn off the phone, and we need to carve out time in our schedule where we can get with God and we can hear him speak to us. We can hear his word to us. We can be quiet before. Maybe it's going outside, going on a walk or going on a hike. Maybe it's the space in your house. I'm just going to get away for a moment. But maybe the volume is too loud in your life. Tonight at 5 o'clock, we're having a night of prayer as a church. And we want to invite you to come back here tonight at 5 o'clock as we pray in the spirit together. As we pray um, as we, as, for God's spirit to move through the people of Bayleaf to advance his kingdom. And we want to invite you back tonight to get quiet and come together as the people of God and to pray. So that's tonight at 5 o'clock. I'd like to invite you back. So ego, we have uh, comfort, volume. Finally, this is the last thing that could be blocking the Spirit's work in your life, and it's Christ. Maybe you don't know him. Maybe you don't know Christ. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says this, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Examine yourself. Test yourself. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless you fail the test? Is Jesus Christ in you? Paul says in Romans 8, 9, anyone who does not have the Spirit of God does not belong to him. Jesus is the true son of oil. He is the true anointed one who came to pay for our sins and to give us the Holy Spirit. That Jesus, he is the one who came, he he was born. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross. He resurrected. He ascended into heaven and then he gives his Holy Spirit to the church. And he gives his Holy Spirit to us so we can advance his kingdom to continue the work that he began here on earth. And, and so maybe the Spirit is not working in your life because you haven't been redeemed by Jesus. You haven't come to faith in Jesus. You've never repented of your sins, turned from those sins, and trust in the finished work of Christ. That we have the two greatest problems in our life are sin and death, and Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins, and he resurrected to conquer this fear of death. And that if we believe in him, we'll have eternal life. And we'll receive the spirit of God in our hearts. And maybe this morning you don't have the spirit of God in your life and you feel like sin is just overwhelming you and, and, and taking over your life and you can't get free from it and you're, you're, just, you're struggling with all these different emotions and, and you just feel defeated. Well, understand this, that you need Jesus. You need Jesus to come into your life. You need the Holy Spirit of God. That you can't live your life in your own might and your own power. That you need the Spirit of God. And so this morning, if you feel the Holy Spirit drawing you, if he's speaking to your hearts, as as you're hearing God's word, we invite you to believe on Jesus, to turn from your sins and to trust in the Savior. Man, as the people of God, as Bailey, we need God's Spirit. You know, right now we're we're a church, we we don't have a senior pastor, and we're looking for that man, right? Right? And, um, but here's the thing, as a church, we could still advance forward. We could still advance God's kingdom right now, even though we don't have that person, right? Right? Amen. Amen. Like, even when we find that person, that man, he's not going to do it in his own strength, in his own power, in his own creativity, his own ingenuity. He's going to need the spirit of God. And so we, as the people of God, we need the spirit of God. And we, as God's spirit moves through us, can right now advance God's kingdom here in Raleigh and around the globe. And that's what God wants to do. He wants to use you and all of us to advance his kingdom by his spirit. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word here in the book of Zechariah. Lord, as we continue this series, Lord, may we learn 
how to live lives by your spirit. Father, help us to get rid of our ego and get rid of our pride and help us to to get rid of the comfort we try to live in and help us to get rid of the volume. Help us to trust in you. Lord, help us to follow you. Help us to be led by your spirit. Fill us with your spirit this morning, this week. Empower us, Lord. Help us not to live lives in our own strength and our own might, but by your spirit. Lord, I pray for anyone in here right now that doesn't know you. Lord, I pray that this might be the morning they trust in you. They come to faith in you. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. It's in his good name we pray. Amen.